jump in. So we'll uh, get started now, and as we're settling in, turn to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read just the last few verses of the chapter, starting in verse 25. Starting in verse 25. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's... uh, open with a word of prayer. Father, again, we welcome uh, time in your word. We recognize this is not the word of man. It's not Paul's word, though he was your agent in penning Galatians. We know this is your word, and we know we need to orient to it accordingly and handle it accordingly. And we thank you that since it's your word, you desire for us to come to understand it in truth, uh, embrace it by faith, and align our lives according to the clear understanding of it. That's our desire and objective, and we just uh, can have the confidence that, that since that's your will, that we can anticipate that being true in each of our lives as we submit ourselves to what you're doing in our lives through it. So we want to just commit our time in your word to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we're about halfway through the second major division of Galatians, which that second major division, chapters 3 and 4, represents the more doctrinal portion of the book. And Since we're halfway through that section, we're about halfway through the book. Uh, And last week, within that middle subsection there, we started the section beginning in chapter 3, verse 26, that could be designated sons and heirs through Christ. And that continues on through uh, verse 7 of chapter 4. And in it, Paul gets more personal with the Galatians, as he builds practically on his previous points about the promise and the law, faith and works. And we can take application personally ourselves uh, through that. And in doing so, in getting personal with Galatians, he lays out several blessings of the grace, promise, faith way in reminding the Galatian believers of what they now possess as believers in Christ and that which should be a tremendous encouragement to them. In contrast to the burdensome detour into legalism that many of them had apparently chosen to embark on. So he's trying to kindle and refresh their mind of some of the things that they perhaps had already experienced and had familiarity with relative to the relationship they have with God through Christ. We just about finished chapter 3 last week and we made it through verse 28. Uh, the best way to summarize what we've seen would be to look at the particular blessings that each of these verses described and then build off of that. Verse 26, we saw that uh, the absolute unconditional sonship in Christ kind of is a theme of that verse 26. Believers are identified as sons of God. As we saw, the word for sons is huios, which emphasizes the nature of the relationship rather than the the fact of the relationship, the nature of the relationship rather than the fact of the relationship. In larger biblical context, the word relates to one as having the full dignity and privileges of an adult son. In other words, one may be a babe in Christ as far as their status or condition of growth, but in their standing... They're adult sons in God's family. That's uh, pretty counterintuitive, the way we look at things humanly speaking, but that's the truth of the word. As we saw with 
you are, the verb you are, speaking of you are all sons of God, it's in the present active indicative. The one having believed in Christ keeps on being a son of God. This standing is unalterable. So this verse may not be only taken as a statement of fact, but as we said and saw also as a promise of security. But on the flip side, the, this verse confirms along with many others in the Word of God that there is no universal fatherhood of God or universal brotherhood of man. God is the creator of all, but He's not the father of all. We are all fellow creatures, but we are not all brothers as far as the human race is concerned. Verse 27, as far as a second blessing is concerned, we saw that the believer is uh, in living union with Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, one with a very attuned ear reminded me that there is no such thing as a second blessing of the Spirit. <laughs> I didn't intend for this point to come across that way, and I didn't even think of it myself. It just happened to be second on the list. <laughs> so, uh, I hope it didn't come across uh, that way. I think we dealt with it in context. As we saw, the baptism of the Spirit into Christ is one of the many things that happen in the life of the believer at the moment of salvation. It's just, like I said, the way it laid out in my list here, that it came across that way. It happens at the moment of salvation. There is no second separate blessing or a separate second blessing. Uh, and it's, it's phrased other ways too. I think it's it's maybe something that the Pentecostals primarily uh, advance as a notion, and that is uh, a second baptism of the Holy Spirit entering into the full power of the Holy Spirit in some way. But that, for the believer, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs at the moment of salvation. From the word baptizo, baptized, deno uh, baptized denotes a complete identification of an object with the item in which that object is immersed or baptized. We saw this in several classical usage, uses which served as, in some cases, vivid illustrations of that. As it relates to the believer in Christ, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit places us into Christ. The verb baptizo here and in a couple other passages we looked at is in the passive voice, signifying that we received this action. Again, as we stated, it is one of the many things that God does on our behalf at the moment of salvation. It's not something that we actively do ourselves. It's something that the action is upon us by God. We believe in God. We receive. We believe in Christ. That's our action. And we receive baptism along with many other blessings as believers. In looking at other passages, we noted that this baptism identifies us with Christ's death and resurrection. So, in essence, through baptism, we are fully identified with the very message of the gospel that saves us. We also saw that we are identified with Christ's body, the church, which is the basis of our relationship to one another. And having been baptized into Christ, we are clothed positionally in Christ. You see that in the end of verse 27. We have put on Christ. The word means to be clothed with Christ. And this is in a positional sense. And we saw that this coincides with, or coincided with the contemporary, to Paul, image of a Roman man coming of age and putting on the garment that signified that he was now a grown-up son. So again, we are adult sons as sons of God through Christ. The significance of our baptism into Christ cannot be understated. As believers in Christ, we are secure, not by our own works or faithfulness, but by God's act of placing us, among other things, placing us in Christ, whereby we enjoy all the positional blessings before God, of, as it were, of Christ Himself. Now, what a contrast with the law works basis of hope and security. 
verse 28, uh, this standing transcends every human status or distinction. There's a oneness in Christ that transcends every human status or distinction, such that as believers we are all one equally in Christ. Paul addresses the three prominent categories of bias. There's ethnic or racial bias. We see this in the verse. I'm not going to read through the verse. Um, Again, we went through that. Civil or social bias and gender or sex bias. In pointing this out, Paul was challenging many of the biases of his day and which were much deeper and extreme in his day than we see here in America today, though some of these still prevail strongly in certain cultures. And if you don't have tunnel vision, you probably observe this or are aware of this. I noted one dark example this week in an online article of the New York Times Uh, Recently, a Bangladeshi 14-year-old girl was ambushed and raped by an older cousin. Uh, She was just going about the normal business of her day. According to Sharia law, as dispensed by the local imam, the girl was convicted with an honor crime and sentenced to 100 lashes. Now, you have heard that the Jewish law limited the number of lashes to 40 for good reason. And they even went one short to make sure they didn't legally break that limit. Uh, Because some individuals, even at that rate of lashing, didn't survive. Well, after 70 lashes, this uh, young teen girl fell unconscious to the ground. And she died a week later of her injuries and blood loss. Her death was officially listed as a suicide. Um, since rape victims in that culture uh, are expected to commit suicide to spare her family the stigma of an honor crime. So the primary point here is one of cultural gender bias. And we find confirmation of the, in addition to seeing this as something that's still very strongly a cultural issue in certain places in the world, certain uh, cultures where it prevails, we also find confirmation of the horrors of Sharia law in general, which may end up gaining a greater foothold in the Middle East when all the dust settles. And I would add to that, it's, there's already little subcultures set up in America where this is people are they're allowed to kind of do their own thing. And we've seen some of these issues come up and have to be dealt with by our legal system. And as you'll hear John White mention, if if you stay for third hour, he's got an article. I'll have to give him back the the paper. I took it, but I'll give it back to him. Um, I did see this one mentioned too. But where where Christianity is being snuffed out, Sharia law is expanding. So that's the world we live in. And and it's coming to the, the United States too. But anyway, that... So we see... In Paul's day, it might not have been quite as extreme as that, but we did read some quotes last year relative to gender bias that showed that women were considered one step above animals, basically, uh, in in the way both some the Jewish culture and uh, other cultures of the day looked at them. Now, there is only one effectual answer to biases to whatever degree they are manifest among mankind. There's only one effectual answer. No matter how hard man tries, even in his recognizing the bias, to resolve it himself, he's failed. And what is that? Well, Paul states it plainly. Men must be saved. He doesn't say that. We'll assume that. And then, here, orient to one another according to the oneness we share in Christ. That is how you deal with human biases through the oneness that a believer shares with another in Christ. It is not a matter of eliminating our distinctions. In some cases, that's impossible. It's a matter of seeing each other as God sees us in Christ. And though the unbeliever doesn't share this status, we extend consideration to them through God's eyes as 
those that have been made in His image, and those for whom Christ died. So we have a higher level of of um, consideration as uh, from one believer to another, but that does not remove the unbeliever from that picture in terms of God's view and our extending uh, consideration to them as well, biblically. Okay, now let's move on to verse 29. Go ahead and read that again here. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Paul has now come full circle as it were, in summarizing the essence of his point in this whole chapter. Paul has used Abraham prominently since verse 7 to clarify Abraham's true legacy and progeny. The Judaizers had rightly identified Abraham as a key individual through whom God would direct his salvation. But they had wrongly understood and advocated what that salvation involved. What we see could be likened to a tug-of-war between the Judaizers and Paul concerning truth about God's plan of salvation as it relates to the promise of Abraham. Now let's look back in chapter 3 in the context to review how Paul speaks of Abraham's role. Back in starting in verse 7, and we're going to just read excerpts here. Well, he introduced Abraham in verse 6, but now going on, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. The word in verse 7 for sons is again huios, We noted in going over verse 7 at the time that the terms sons of Abraham and sons of God in verse 26 are not in conflict in the sense that Paul is expressing each relative to the stage of his argument in favor of the grace faith way over the law works way. In using huios in verse 7, Paul was again emphasizing beyond the fact of the relationship, the distinction of the relationship to Abraham that was possessed by the believer in Christ rather than the law-keeping Jew. So he, in using that word, was emphasizing for the purpose of his argument the distinction that he's establishing between the law works way and the grace faith way. Moving down to verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The blessing of Abraham that is most notably uh, a reference to the promised blessing of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So here Paul is connecting in, in the terms he uses with the blessing of Abraham attached or Uh, inherent in the promise to Abraham in early Genesis or the first time it was expressed to him in Genesis 12. And we read from verse 2 of that context in Genesis 12 2, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So that's what Paul is he's drawing on familiar understanding certainly among the Jewish believers of that promise to Abraham given in Genesis 12, and he's associating it with the grace faith way, not the law works way. Moving down to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So Paul now goes on to express the preeminence of the promise over the law in this section. 
Paul's primary point here is that God did not alter his plan of salvation by way of grace promised faith when he added the law for a time. Christ has from eternity remained the single way of salvation and the single focus of that way in the promise to Abraham, though the truth about the Savior has been progressively revealed in time. The law coming later and being then done away with as a rule of life for the believer when Christ had come did not alter the force of the promise. Now, in verse 29... Paul draws on all of these points and tying them together. The if in 3.29 there, if you are Christ, is a first class condition. In other words, if and it's true. Thus the sentence could start, and since you are Christ. It's not a possibility. Paul is expressing something that is a fact. So, and since you are Christ's, He goes on to state what that, the implications. The believer, first we see here, in Christ, who is the seed with a big S, is the true seed, seed with a little s, of Abraham. So the believer in Christ is the true seed of Abraham. And that parallels, back in verse 7, Paul using the phrase, sons of Abraham. Seed of Abraham, sons of Abraham. Paul could have said it this way, since you are in Christ, and thus Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, for Christ is Abraham's seed. So you're in Christ, and you share that status of the seed of Abraham. Now this is perhaps the best way to capture the essence of the debate between those of law works and those of grace faith. The seed of Abraham described those who were truly related to God within the early church, which was still under heavy Jewish influence. That is not the question. That phrase, identifying someone as uh, truly related to God, is not the question. The question is, how is this phrase properly understood and defined? We can find the basis of both positions on this in Scripture. And we're going to work our way through to see how the understanding of this phrase comes out. Turn first to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, and we're going to start in verse 46. I'm just going to read at the beginning here. This is known as the Magnificat or Song of Mary, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. I just want to read that by way of introduction. Now turn, go down to 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. As to the intended meaning of the seed of Abraham, we discern it from the context with understanding of the thinking of the one using that phrase. And here it would be Mary. And we were going to make a conclusion about what Mary was thinking as we come back to this and developing it further. But in going to this phrase further, turn back to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, starting in verse 5. Remember His marvelous works which He has done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. O seed of Abraham, His servant, you children of Jacob, His chosen ones, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. The psalmist here seems to be emphasizing the physical line of Israel at this point. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. I'm going to read just verse 1. 
Romans 11.1 1. I say then, has God cast away His people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. In what way is Paul speaking of being of the seed of Abraham here? Physical uh, heritage. Turn forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read, just for the purpose of our point here, out of context, the verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Again, Paul understands the distinction here in using seed of Abraham, but in this context, he's relating himself to the, to the physical heritage that he shares, the religious and physical heritage that he shares with others of the, of the Jewish race. Now let's go back to Romans 4. Romans 4, going to read a few verses starting in verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now what do we see here? We're starting to see a distinction Right, Paul acknowledges that those acknowledges on one hand those who are the seed of Abraham by way of physical lineage and particular selection, but not as representing those uh, as those who have attained a relationship with God through His grace. He recognizes the distinction, but he doesn't recognize them as having achieved a relationship with God by that heritage. In fact, he identifies that that's not the case. Turn ahead to chapter 9 in Romans. Nine. Verse 6 through 8. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. I think that's pretty straightforward there. He contrasts those that are of the physical heritage and seed of Abraham in that respect from those who are uh, the children of God because of their faith in Christ and therefore they are the children of the promise as intended by God. Finally, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, and we will read starting in verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Again, we see fairly clearly a reference not to the physical lineage as being... uh, 
those that are the seed of Abraham, but those who are of faith. And it is apparent that the disagreement was and remains over sufficiency of physical heritage and religious heritage versus the need for something more. And I say remains among those who are Orthodox Jews today. They still put their trust in their physical heritage as being their connection to to a relationship with God. Of course, as bolstered by their religious observances. But it is equally clear, as we've seen even in these passages, that something more is required than that physical or religious heritage. So, what do you think that Mary had in mind when she referred to the seed of Abraham? Well, without being dogmatic, I think reading the context, the reference reference right up front to God, her Savior, she has some understanding of the spiritual aspect of that phrase, uh, though she would have had strong influence from her Jewish heritage as well. But I think from the context, it points to the truth that we are studying. So back in Galatians 3.29... So we first saw in this verse that the believer in Christ is the true seed of Abraham. Secondly, in this verse, we see that the believer in Christ is an heir according to the promise to Abraham. As he had previously described and that we looked at in part in verses 13 through 18 of chapter 3, where Paul speaks of the blessing, the promise, and the inheritance. And I'm just connecting this verse by way of a uh, summary that Paul, in the way that Paul uses it as a summary in tying up his his argument in verse in chapter three. Now, as to the significance of this to the Galatians and other Christians of the early church facing the onslaught of the Judaizers, James Boyce says this: The prize the legalizers had been holding before the eyes of the Galatian Christians and by which they had hoped to win them to the ceremonial aspects of Judaism was the possibility of becoming part of the seed of Abraham. They meant physical seed. Paul now replies that what the legalizers were offering through circumcision was actually already theirs in Christ. But it was only theirs in Him. He is the seed to whom the promises were made. Believers enter into the promises by entering into Him, thereby also becoming spiritual seed to God. So, this, what what James Boyce is building off of here is verse 26 stating that we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus and then we were baptized into Christ. It is in that baptism or in that sharing of all that Christ is that we also are seeds of Abraham because he is the seed of Abraham as Paul had built uh, had had mentioned or developed earlier in chapter 3 and finally in keeping with verses 26 and 27 the believer in Christ has been finally with respect to verse 29 that is The believer in Christ has been placed in Christ and therefore is Christ's possession. The word for heirs, so that kind of summarizes verse 29 as it connects to the preceding context. The word for heirs is of the same root word as the word inheritance that we saw in verse 18. The word is Kleronomos, and it is also found as we go forward in our context in verse 1 of chapter 4 and verse 7. So we will work with the deal with the word now, and, and then we won't have to spend much time with it going forward. In, verse, in, in our verse here, it appears to be used in the general sense of one who has acquired or obtained the portion allotted to him. More specifically, according to Vines, it refers to believers 
inasmuch as they share in the new order of things to be ushered in at the return of Christ. Now, you see there in Vine's definition a future emphasis of what our inheritance is going to be. But the verb here, you are, that extends to Christ's, Abraham's seed, and heirs, is in the present active indicative, which speaks of a present possession of that heirship. We, whatever it is that we are heirs of in Christ, we are in present possession of that. Whether it's blessings in time or the blessings we'll experience in the future millennial age. The word heir serves as the basis of a parenthetical explanation in the first seven verses of chapter 4. So Paul wanted to drive this point home by spending more time with it as he goes on. Particularly since it had such strong cultural connections, the idea of heirship. We'll look at some of that. In wrapping up verse 29, we can add then the next blessing. Oops, sorry there. The next blessing of the grace faith way that Paul has laid out in this context. And that is status as the true seed of Abraham and heirs of the promise. So, starting back, we saw in verse 26, now we have a blessing for each verse that Paul lays out relative to the grace faith way, the blessings for those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. Okay. Pardon me. Okay. Now as we move on to chapter 4, I'm going to go to this slide one last time. This is the way that James Boyce had outlined Paul's alternating argument of this context starting back in verse 6. In developing the notion of heirship further, Paul flips from the faith side of the coin back to the works side of the coin, or more specifically, to the bondage of works. And this is the last element of his argument directly, as in terms of Paul's argument, directly back to the question posed in chapter 3, verse 5. And paraphrasing that question, did you find a relationship, speaking to the Galatians, did you find a relationship with God through works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So now he's come to the last section of his argument I could say an extended argument in alternating back and forth between the faith side and the law work side. Now we're going to get through as much of the first part of chapter 4 as we can. Um, let's go ahead and read chapters or verses 1 and 2 first. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Having identified believers as heirs of the promise, as opposed to physical Jews and others who claim or seek such status by law works, Paul takes time to build on this concept using other illustrations um, relative to the ones he used in the previous context to drive home the important truth about the believer standing in Christ. Paul starts here in verses 1 and 2 by expanding on an illustration that he'd already kind of touched upon in chapter 3, verses 24 through 27. First, let's look at some of the key words in these verses. Uh, We've already looked at the word heir, It is the same word in the Greek used in verse 29, but it is here used with a temporal emphasis. In other words, the person to whom property is to pass on the death of the owner. Paul is establishing a temporal illustration, and that's the way this word is is, uh, taken in this context. And that's according to Vine. Now, this is still the traditional way that this is understood. But Paul, and 
so it's it's a way in which we understand this word to be used. If you're an heir of a great fortune, well, that passes on to you at the death of the one who presently holds it, barring any legal shenanigans. Um, but Paul is not necessarily, for the purpose of his illustration, homing in on this aspect of this word. He rather is simply going to use it in the sense of ultimate inheritance of something assigned but not yet entered into. That's another way in which this could be looked at. Something that's assigned but not yet entered into. The word for child is napios. It can mean infant or very young child, but it can also mean minor or one who is not of age, which is the way in which it is obviously used here. The word Words for servant or slave and master or lord, depending on your translation, are doulos and kurios. Doulos and kurios, respectively, which we are very familiar with. The meanings are clearly conveyed here in the English and don't uh, present any problems with respect to the illustration. The word for guardians isn't paedagogos, which we saw in the previous chapter, in verses 24 and 25, it's epitropos. And it seems to be a less austere word, but it bears essentially the same meaning of someone who is a guardian. More specifically here, one who has delegated charge over minor children with respect to their person, keeping track of them, keeping them in order. Finally, the word for stewards is oikonomos, You heard that word last night when we were looking at dispensations. Oikonomos. Of course, it can be used in different ways, in different contexts. Here, it relates to the management of household affairs and assets. In this context, then it relates to the delegated charge of one over minor children with respect to their possessions. So, guardians deals with their person. Stewards deals with their possessions. Now, in using these words, Paul draws on the cultural norm of his day. In his commentary on Galatians, James Boyce, again, he seems I'm picking on him a lot today, he does a good job of explaining this. And it's two parts. It's a fairly lengthy reading, but this is what was in Paul's mind when he sets this illustration. And we have to orient to what... Uh, was going on in his mind at the time he wrote this as best we can. The English reader will miss the flavor of these verses, speaking of verses 1 through 7 of chapter 4, unless he realizes that the moment of growing up was a very definite one in antiquity and that it involved matters of great religious and legal importance. For instance, in Judaism, a boy passed from adolescence to manhood shortly after his 12th birthday at which time he became a son of the law. In the Greek world, the minor came of age later, at about 18. But there was the same emphasis on an entering into a full responsibility as an adult. At this age, at the festival of the Apaturia, the child passed from the care of his father to the care of the state and was responsible to it. Under Roman law, There was also a time for the coming of age of a son. But the age when this took place may not have been as fixed as is often assumed. And he cross-references apparently Lightfoot's work on that. With the result that the father may have had discretion in setting the time of his son's maturity. If this is so... It leads one to think that Paul is referring primarily to the Roman custom as he observed that a child is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. A Roman child became an adult at the sacred family festival known as the Liberalia, held annually on the 17th of March. At this time, the child was formally adopted by the father as his acknowledged son and heir and received the toga virilis in place of the toga protexta, which he had previously worn. So, Paul, this 
is the cultural context that surrounded Paul as he is drawing on this illustration. So as James Boyce states, you know, our frame of reference wouldn't relate to this in the same way that Paul is using it in going forward in the passage. So we, we need to kind of take a look at this to get a sense of the parallel that he's going to draw spiritually to this as he moves forward. And you can see, you know, there's three major cultures at the time. There, In fact, uh, John mentioned that in his message this morning. And you've got the Roman culture, the Greek culture, and you've got the, the Jewish culture. And which one was in mind? It seems to be more perhaps the Roman one. And as we go forward, you will see that more clearly. Furthermore, though the child... As we look back now at verse 4 here, though the child is spoken of as master of all or lord of all with respect to his ultimate promotion, that's looking ahead to what his ultimate promotion will be, for the time being, he is the equivalent positionally of a slave in the household until the appointed time of his coming of age and formal adoption. So he is just a fixture in the household with great potential but yet is not and has not entered into that blessing or that heirship at that time Ron Merriman sums up Paul's intent this way quote as long as an heir was a minor he was in subjection both as to his person and his property this illustration is purely secular and fits in general the various legal systems of Paul's day. So again, they all par- parallel in his day in a different way that, what, in, that we see in our culture. Sure, we, we understand inheritance. Kids don't grow up until they're, what, 30 now? <laughs> so, you know, Jewish culture is 12, Greek culture is 14, Roman culture, or no, what, Greek was 18, Roman uh, you know, they scoped it out and maybe had a little bit more flexibility and determined it on when they were ready. But we don't have the same official... Uh, well, there might be subcultures in ours that do. The, the Jews still have bar mitzvahs and things like that relative to this type of thing. But we don't have any formal... Well, in terms of actual growing up and getting the blessings of adulthood in the sense that are stated here. So... In looking at going forward in in these next few verses, Paul may have been drawing on the Greek or Roman custom of the day in the sense of what conforms most to his illustration. And boy, I don't want to get started on the next section because I won't be able to finish. You're going to get some extra time today. <laughs> I won't. I won't. I'll take it from you next time. <laughs> Okay, so we will pick up next time in verse 3 and hopefully make some headway, maybe even finish that section up. Okay, I'll take that as an endorsement and we'll close in prayer. (laughs) Father, we do thank you again for your word and especially for what your word reveals to us about your tremendous provision for us as your children. Uh, sons of Christ, our sons of God through Christ Jesus, and we we recognize that there's nothing that we can do to merit or secure for ourselves those blessings, and we know that you supplied that at a great cost, and it's it's simply ours relative to taking you at your word. That's what you seek from us is to believe you. And, and then enter into the, the blessings, not just at the point of salvation, but day by day as we come to understand these things and, ha- and allow them to really affect our lives and not only to relate to you in keeping more with our understanding of truth, but to one another as well. So we just again thank you for your, our time in the Word this morning. I ask your continued blessing on what we've heard that it might become more real in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.